Presenting Orson Welles as the third man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character, originally created in the story The Third Man, with zither music by Anton Karras. Well, I've messed around in a lot of messy things. You know me, I'm certainly no angel. But I never had anything to do with murder, or dope, or blackmail. Except just once. With blackmail, that is. Not my fault, either, as I think you'll agree. But all the same, I'm sorry to have ever come within breathing distance of that caper, because as several people during the course of this little story had occasion to point out, blackmail is a nasty word. That's the title of the tale. Stick around and see if you don't agree. started in Marseille back in 47. I was running cigarettes into France in those days, cigarettes and a few other commodities, as I think I've told you before. And I had a nice little sailing boat with an auxiliary, typical pleasure craft of those waters, to use as a cover. This was in September, and I'd just come into port that afternoon. A few of us had been having dinner in the town. I was on my way back to the boat alone. It was late, about four in the morning, cold, rather foggy. Suddenly, looming ahead of me in the mist... And lurching drunkenly, I saw the figure of a man. Big fellow he was. I thought I'd stay out of his way. Marseille's a tough town, one of the toughest in the world. It's a good place not to have any trouble in, so that's why I tried to keep clear of the drunk. But before I could get out of the way, he caught sight of me, uttered a strange, muffled sort of cry, and suddenly threw himself forward. I braced myself for a fight, but before I knew it, he was down on his knees in front of me, groaning. Then all at once I realized he wasn't drunk at all. That all that wet on his chest was blood. I never found out who did it. Even after I took him onto my yacht and tried to do what I could for him, never told me who it was that had stabbed him. The knife had gone in just over his heart, and by dawn it was pretty clear that he wasn't going to live through the day. He seemed to realize it, too. They got me... And it doesn't matter why, me. maybe they were right. They got me, and now, very soon, I'm going to die. What is your name? Lime, Harry Lime. I've heard of you. You've quite a reputation, Monsieur Lime. I, I call you Harry. Okay. I am Draco. Yes, I see from your face that you have heard of me, too. You, you call me Marcel. Okay, Marcel. That way I spend my last hour or so among friends. Marcel Bracco. A real Marseillaise. Born quite a while ago anyway. Died September 12th, 1947. Profession, crook. All kinds of crook. Some of the dirtiest kinds I knew there. Among other things, I'd heard that Bracco was the chief of the Amazons. It was a gang of girls. Crooks, all of them. Used it. No, the big ugly man in my berth wasn't one of the nice people. And you mustn't think because I'm telling you this story that I have anything to say in his favor. But he was a guy. See what I mean? He was somebody. And he was dying. <laughs> Steady, old man. Easy does it. I'm with you. I haven't got time to make a wheel. I... I know that sounds like a joke, but I'm serious, Harry. I'd like to leave you something to show my gratitude, something 
to remember me by. That's okay, old man. Look, all I can give you is this. And it's worth something, Harry. It's worth quite a lot. If I give you a name. A name, Harry. Do not think I am joking. This, this name is just as good as money or jewels. Remember it. The name it is Maurice Chivolet. Did you hear that, Harry? Chivolet. Maurice Chivolet. Well, who is he? Oh, he's many things, Harry. He's a very many different sorts of men. You must remind him of this. It will be like money to you. Where do I find him? In the Chamber of Deputies of the National Assembly of France. What do I say to him? Say... S I'm dying, Harry. Hold my hand. I am, old man. I'm holding it. I haven't time to tell you. You must ask Julia. Julia? Yes, Julian Moreau. Moreau? Moreau. But he was dead. I pulled the sheet up over his big, ugly face and went out of the cabin and locked the door. Three months later in Paris, in a little nightclub in Montparnasse, I ran into Julian Moreau. Julian was a newspaper man, and in his way, Julian was quite a guy, too. Not a crook, just a newspaper man and a good one. I'd struck up an acquaintance with him, and after a couple of weeks, it had brightened into something resembling friendship. So tonight, I thought the time had come when I could afford to approach him on the subject of my legacy. The precious name. Julian. Yes, Harry? I want to ask you a question. Go ahead. I'm going to mention a name. Well? If it means anything, do you let me know? <laughs> Don't be so mysterious, Harry. What's the name? Givolet. Maurice Givolet. Why do you ask? Why don't you answer? Excuse me, Harry. I want you to tell me why you mentioned that name. You won't tell me anything about him unless I do? I'm afraid not. There was a guy down in Marseille who told me that name. He said it was worth money. Worth money? Yes. That's what he told me. He was dying at the time. That man in Marseille, he must have been a criminal. Well, don't go all prim and moral on me, Julian. Yeah, as a matter of fact, he was something along those lines. What of it? I'm not going moral on you, Eric. I'm nothing very special myself. But when you say to me that the name Maurice Givlet is worth money, <laughs> well... Well, what? There's a nasty world for that, Harry. A nasty world for that kind of money. What do you mean? Chantage. I don't get that. That's French, Harry. French for blackmail. A little later, though, Julian loosened up a little. After a few more drinks. Harry? Yes? That criminal in Marseille you were talking about. Well, you brought him up, Julian. I was asking about a certain Monsieur Givolet. I know. Harry, was the criminal's name Bracco? Marcel Bracco? Yeah, but how do you happen to know him? You're not in the rackets. You're a newspaper man. Marcel was with us for a while in the resistance. He was a brave man, and we got to be friends. But then later, we quarreled. That was after the war. He came to me here in Paris, wanted information about this Givlet. I gave it to him. Givlet is an important man in the government. And through the paper, I arranged an interview between him and Marcel. But I told you, Harry, blackmail something I can't forgive. And Marcel was blackmailing this Givlet? Yes. Not for money, but for protection. Police protection. Marcel, as you probably know, had that gang they call the Amazons. But uh, what was he blackmailing Givlet about? What, what did he have on him? Plenty. And you know what it was? Certainly. Marcel told me. Exactly what was Givlet's past? Ah, uh, Harry. That's Mr. Givlet's secret. <laughs> and yours, old man. It's yours, too. Hmm? Yes, Harry, as you say. It's mine, too. Oh. Must be something pretty bad. Bad enough for a man who's trying to make something decent of himself. Oh, don't think I like Mr. Givlet. I hate him. But as long as he behaves himself, I won't denounce him. As long as he behaves himself. So that's your price, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you see, old man? In a way, you're a blackmailer yourself. Then, some months later, in the lobby of the Georges Cinq in Paris, 
Calling Mr. Lime, Monsieur Harry Lime, yes. Monsieur Lime. Yes, boy. Monsieur Lime. Yes, what is it, a phone call? There is a lady to see you, Monsieur Lime. She's waiting in the lobby. A lady, young or old? Young, Monsieur Lime, and very pretty. Well, lead the way, old man. What are we waiting for? <laughs> You are Harry Lime? Insist on the original, honey. Accept no substitutes. This is it. I don't understand. I'm Harry Lime. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Who are you? We haven't got around to that yet. You have not given me a chance to tell you. True enough. My name is Muller. Heidi Muller. Glad to know you, Heidi. Shall we go into the bar and have a drink? It's a little early for dinner, but... This is serious, Mr. Lime. I've come to see you on business. I was afraid of that. Well, go ahead. I have been told about you, Mr. Lamb. Well, idle gossip, honey. You know how people talk. I'm a straight, upright, clean-living, law-abiding citizen. Uh, what is it you had in mind? Well, I, I... Which particular law did you want me to break for you? I want a passport. Passport? Oh, that's easy. We can arrange that for you in a couple of days. This man here in Paris does very good work, but the best phony passports come from Amsterdam, if you're willing to wait. It is not as simple as that. Oh? I want a passport for my father. Well, just give me his name, the other particulars, and a photograph. By the way, what kind of passport do you want? American, British, Panamanian? Mr. Lime, my father is not here. He's in Romania. Romania? Yes. On the other side of the Iron Curtain. And you want me to get a passport to him in Romania? That's right. That's practically impossible. Uh, Mr. Lime... Well, now, now, mind you, when I say practically... Uh, that's what I mean. It's practically for Harry Lyme. Nothing is strictly impossible, just expensive, uh, if you get what I mean. Mm, no, I did not. Well, how much dough can you spend? Money? Yes, money. If you want to get a passport to your father in Romania... I'm not going to pay anything, Mr. Lyme. What? You're going to do this for me as a gift. You've come to the wrong man, Heidi. I, I'm sorry, I'd like to help, but I never break the law except on a strictly commercial basis. Besides, an operation Mr. like Lyme, this... Mr. this is very embarrassing. It certainly is, dear. But I, I told you, you were going to do this for me without charging me money. And you are, Mr. Lyme. Shall I tell you why? Yes, it'd be very interesting to hear. I believe you are in trouble now with the French police, Mr. Honey, Lyme. Honey, I'm always in trouble with the French police. Why? Yesterday, they sent for me and asked me to identify you. Asked you to identify me? Why? What's the caper? I do not know. It is something to do with... Counterfeit money. Oh, yes, that casino business. That happened in August in Cannes. They never got me on it. The money was passed, all right. They know that, but they can't pin it on me. I was there on the casino, Mr. Lamb. The police discovered that I was next in line at the cashiers. When they found that out, they came to me. They want me to be a witness against you. They want me to swear that I saw you passing that counterfeit money. I see. And, uh, what did you tell them? Well, first, I asked them questions about you. Hmm. That's how I found out that you are... Well, who you are. Yeah, I see. And McCarty, tell me the truth. Did you really see me pass that money? No. As a matter of fact, I didn't, but unless you helped me with my father, Mr. Lyme, I'll say that I did. And then, of course, you'd go to jail. Hmm. Well? well? That reminds me of something a friend of mine was saying last night. The French have a nasty word for what you're up to, young lady. I can't remember what it is now. Blackmail is a bad word in any language. In a moment, Orson Welles returns as Harry Lyme, the third man.
Mama Rudzinski. That's who I thought I'd apply to with my little problem. Mama Rudzinski is quite a character and a great authority on passports, frontiers, international laws in general, and how to break them in particular. Hello? This is Harry Lyme speaking. Harry Lyme, I want to speak to Mama. Hello, Mama. Yes? It's Harry, Mama. How are you? Lime, Mama. Harry Lime, I'm in trouble. I need help. Bad trouble? Sort of. Come up. I see you right away. An hour later, I'd filled Mama in on the whole story and was waiting for advice. Well, Harry, it's a tricky business. I don't need to tell you. The phony passport's easy. But uh, finding this man Muller in Romania and uh, then getting him back through the Iron Curtain, it's no joke. Look, Mama, I didn't come here to listen to how difficult it is. I want some help. Well, there are two ways. Yeah? The first way, you go to Romania yourself. That's the way I don't like. I don't blame you. A man can get killed around there. The other way is uh, through diplomatic channels. Well, the way you say it, it sounds easy, Mama, but... Do you know any ambassadors? No. I don't know any ambassadors, and neither do you. All you need is somebody high up in the government here in France. If you could just find a weak place somewhere, a weak place where you could uh, put some pressure. You mean blackmail? I don't like the word, Harry. No. I mean pressure. Just find the soft place where you can push. Hmm? Hey, where are you going? Sit down, I'm making a nice glass of tea. Thanks, Mama, but I haven't got time. I've got to find myself one of those soft places. And then, Mama, I've got to start pushing. Pushing quick or else. Or else? It's that same old word, Mama. I don't like it any more than you do. Blackmail? Pressure, Mama, pressure. So long. Monsieur Lyme? Yes? Monsieur Givelet will see you now. Come this way, please. Thank you. Monsieur Lyme? Oh, yes. Come in, please. What can I do for you? Well, I'll get right down to the point, Givelet. I know you're a busy man as well as an important one. Well? I have a favor to ask. Ah? Huh? There's a man in Romania. He's stateless. Nansen passport before the war. His daughter's here in France. She wants to get him out. Are you serious, Monsieur? Uh, Lyme. Lyme. Such a thing as you are asking. Why, it's practically impossible. And I will be frank with you. I don't even know who you are. Lime, Harry Lime. I told you that only. Well, you see, even on the highest ministerial level... It would be, as you say, practically impossible. I like that word, practically, Mr. Givlet. It gives me a little hope. Yes, but... I know. Don't bother to say it again. You don't know me from Adam, Monsieur Givlet, but there you see I have the advantage. I know you from Adam, Monsieur Givlet. I even know you from Monsieur Givlet. I don't understand. I've been in touch with a friend of yours. What friend of mine? A man called Bracco. What? Marcel Bracco. The name seems to mean a good deal to you. He said it would. Bracco is dead. But not Bracco's secret, not your secret, old man. He gave it to me before he died. Now then, when can I expect some action on my client, Miller? Your client? The man who needs a passport. Remember, the case you said was practically impossible. Leave the particulars with my secretary. You will hear from me before the end of the week. Thanks, old man. I appreciate this. I really do. And when do I hear from you? Again, I mean, uh, blackmailers always come back. Well, that's a nasty word, old man. Don't use it again. and You won't see me. Well, it worked. Whatever it was, it worked. I was holding a secret over a man's head, and I didn't even know the secret. Yes, whatever I was threatening the politician Givale with seemed to be a threat strong enough, because by the end of next week, Heidi's father was on his way through the Iron Curtain. She said I was wonderful, Heidi did. Asked how she could ever thank me. I told her that thanks didn't come into it. I'm not your benefactor, honey, remember? I told her. I'm your victim. About four months later, Julian wrote me from New York. 
This is Julian Moreau, my newspaper man. Dear Harry, he wrote, now that it's all over, I think you have a right to know the truth. The truth about Givoli, I mean. I'm reading to you now from Julian's letter. Givoli was born in a suburb of Paris. His political life began when he joined a group wearing black boots and brown shirts of a violently anti-democratic character. This was all during the 30s. Then, during World War II, came his big chance. You will see that this Givoli, while essentially a little man, is clever. He secures for himself very early in the German occupation a false identity card, and it is under the false name of Givray that he is a collaborationist, a Nazi stooge, and a black marketeer. His real name is therefore a good name. It is the false one which is bad. Now it's the beginning of 44. Convinced that the Nazis are near the end, he rushes forward to the fighting French and under his real name joins their invasion corps. Under his true identity, he gives them some assistance. And at the end of the war, the power of the resistance becomes overwhelming and their investigations far-reaching. So Givalet drops the false identity of Givray forever. Now, notice, please, that his original name is above reproach, since it was under the false one that he acted for the Nazis. Now, there's need for men like himself, modest, self-effacing, industrious. And so it comes to pass that the little fascist street fighter, the black marketeer, the collaborationist, who betrayed scores of his countrymen to the Germans, is triumphantly elected to the parliament as representative of one of the great historical parties of France. Well, now, my friend, we come to the Amazon. I gave them this title in the newspapers myself just before the war. Theoretically, the racket was broken up, but in fact, it was still flourishing in Paris until the very recent death of a certain Marcel Bracco. This gang worked in pairs late at night, gangs of girls, striking up casual acquaintances with visiting provincial gentlemen of a certain age and steering them to various nightclubs, finally to a cheap bar where the respectable old gentleman was invariably rolled, as you say, in America. In other words, everything was taken from him, and if possible, afterwards, he was blackmailed. Now, some such poor old fellow was being beaten up in a bar by Bracco and the others who worked in his gang when Givalet, driving home from an all-night session at the National Assembly, heard the noise. He was waiting for a traffic light to change, and seeing no police on the street, he went into the little bar to investigate. Now, Mark, this was a genuinely kindly act. The act of a self-respecting French citizen. And you see what it got him. Of course, the gangsters turned on him and beat him senseless. Going through his wallet, they came on his old identity card, which he'd kept for some reason or another, concealed behind a photograph of his mother. It was the card of Givray, the Nazi stooge. Thus, his secret fell into the hands of Bracco, who used it not to extort money, but for police protection for his gang. Very recently, as you may have read in my column, Monsieur Givalet was being considered for an important new post in the ministry. And then you, my dear Harry, came to him with your threats. Threats of exposing something the very nature of which, as it happened, you didn't even understand. Now, Givalet had begun to breathe again, you see, and to hope after Bracco had died. But your visit was too much for him. The French government had put a price on the head of Givray, the Nazi stooge. Givalet, the politician, didn't realize that his secret was safe. Perhaps he was right. A secret like that is never safe. And so it was that after some weeks of waiting for you to return, and of course you never did, his nerve finally cracked. And the very day on which he was to be confirmed in his new post, his housekeeper coming in with a morning coffee found him dead. He was seated before his desk where he had shot himself, seated before a blank piece of paper. He had not even written a note of farewell. I suppose at the end he found it difficult to decide who he could write to, what he would say, and above all, what name he would sign. Harry Lyme returns in just a moment.
And now, Harry Lyme. A few days ago, I was in Paris. I went into a little place I know near the markets where they make a wonderful fish soup. And who should I see having lunch there but Heidi? Heidi and an old gentleman I was sure must be her father. It was. She introduced him and I sat down with him for a drink. So finally, I get to meet the wonderful Harry Lyme. <laughs> this is really a pleasure. Well, I'm glad you're with us here, Miller, on the sunny side of that iron curtain. Thanks to you, Mr. Lyme. Oh, no, really. Me. But yes, <laughs> my daughter has told me everything. Everything, Heidi? Did you tell your father everything? Well, Mr. Lyme, I told him all the wonderful help. But did you tell him how you managed to persuade me to do it? Not exactly, I... Uh, I... Not exactly. What's this? Secrets? Why, Heidi, you're blushing. Heidi, I'll make a deal with you. A deal? I won't tell your father what you did if you let me take you both to lunch. (laughs) But that's blackmail. It's a nasty word, Mr. Miller. Let's not use it again. It'll spoil our soup. (laughs) 